Hello, welcome to my workshop again. Uh, today, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, it's going to be over the next few days, but we're going to take this pile of wood and select the red oak pieces out of it, and we're going to make something like that. Okay, it's not going to look exactly like this. This is a pretty hideous composition. But anyways, uh, we're going to make a oak bench. It'll be made out of red oak. The dimensions exactly are written down over there. I don't have them with me. But uh, this is the project we're going to do, so stick around. I'm going to get set up here, and we'll start ripping into that stuff and make a bench. Okay, so we've got our red oak uh, backrest piece. That's what this is going to be. Uh, we've got our backrest plank out. Now what we have to do is kind of create the shape of the backrest so that we can have these shapes here. Uh, these like scallops for the back left and right side. So what I am going to use for this, I wanted to use a flex curve but this flex curve it's it's really finicky, a pain in the butt to use really. It's, it's hard to get a, a real good kind of a line out of it. So what I thought I would end up doing is instead of using this because then I'd have to you know be really finicky to make it nice and round I figured I would kind of use two tools here and get my circle in place but use this flex curve as a spacer as, a spo as opposed to uh, an actual uh, tool to mark with. And what I mean by that is basically this. I'm going to take this. This is good, basically uh, like an outline of a rough shape here of one of the sides of the, the backrest. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pretty much just level this up with this edge and then this edge and then to get my circle because this is not really round this is pretty choppy looking I'm just going to get this in here and with this here and this there I don't really need this here anymore I'll get rid of this, get this out of the way, that'll be ready for the other side and then with my pencil I'm going to take my pencil and just lightly mark and then I'm going to use a French curve to line up with this mark and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to find where this all would come in nicely here if I need a reference point I guess what I'll do is I'll use this and then with this edge here this edge here I'm going to line it up with the one inch mark over here so that this way I'll have a little bit of a reference point for the next side so that it looks more symmetrical. I don't know if you can, you can see it, but this is lining up at one inch at this edge here. So then what I do here is I'm going to take this line and then I'm just going to follow this curve all the way down. I'm going to need to get that tape measure out of there now. Okay. Now this isn't a perfect exact line, but this is going to give me a real close estimate as far as how this is going to go. All this here is not is not really relevant because we're keeping this. This is going to come up here, we're going to come around here, and then once we come down here, now i got to figure out my curve here so we can continue onward with the bench. Okay, so 38 and a half is going to be right here. Okay, so once I've got that measured, I'm going to take my square and I'm going to square it up so this way I'll have a reference line to know where is 38 and a half inches alright that's my cutoff point now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this side flip it over and here's my reference point here and here and then I'm going to use this again as my tool my reference and then once I have that that's my reference I don't need this anymore and now I'm just going to Kind of do this bit of a three-quarter circle. I don't need to go all the way around. So now I have another circle over here. All right. So this is going to be my edge that I had to follow. This thing is pretty brutal. You can't get a straight edge out of this to save your life. Okay. So I got another straight edge here. Nice long one. And then I'm just going to kind of draw a straight, almost like a straight reference line, right from all the way over to the other side. All the way over to here. So I can kind of line up the tops and the bench, and it keeps everything level. Everything will not go above 
this reference line. So that's what, that's how this left side's not going to stick up higher than the right hand side, or the middle's going to be kind of up and crested. So you can see the shape there. It's uh, it's going to come up here. I'm going to I'm going to cut along this line here, and then we're going to follow it up. And there's the top, and then we've got the other side, and then it comes down over here. A little bit of a crude drawing, but uh, I'll fine tune those lines. But anyways, this is just a very rough cut. It still has to be uh, you know filed down or rasped and then uh, cleaned up and routed and sanded and all that other fun stuff. Cut out the shape after you plane it because if you cut the shape out and then plane it you might nick a corner or an edge or something like that. It's just easier to get it while it's in butcher block formation. Alright so I've got my backrest up on the uh, bandsaw. Uh, we're going to use a this is a 3 8 inch blade that I'm using here so it should be able to allow me to get these radius curves here with that thick of a blade without too much difficulty. Alright, here we go. Let's hope for the best. I'll try not to get my shoulder in the way. So after we finish with the bandsaw, pretty much get rid of the waste portion and we're left with a little bit of a rough outline but you can see this is pretty much the shape. So that takes care of the backrest for now. I'm not going to fine tune anything really. I'm just going to get the parts cut out and then we're going to shape everything and finalize things a little bit later. So right now we're going to move on to the next piece. And the next piece, I believe, well, I can pick a, pick a piece, it doesn't really matter. So I found this piece here, it's about 35 inches. <clears throat> Turn that fan off. A lot of, it looks like a cement that's on there, really. I'm going to get this hooked up into the planer. Once again, we're going to plane this down to an inch and a quarter. We're going to trim up the sides afterwards and uh, make sure she's all nice and square, and uh, which I believe it is, but we'll just double check it. And then from there, that's going to make our seat. The final dimension is going to wind up being 30 inches wide, and uh, it'll attach with a piano hinge at some point connected to pretty much a box frame. Party time! So we've got this plane down. This is about as good as it's going to get. Uh, I ran it through the planer right down to its uh, inch and a quarter. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, take my measurement and uh, go 30 inches, make it 30 inches square. So we're going to end up with a 30 inch wide bench seat. And in order to obviously do that, I'm going to need my tape measure 
and we'll make a mark and then once we've got that we'll make a cut. Table saw cutting time. So that's basically the back and the seat and now if I get my cut list, if I can find where I put the thing, usually I put something down and I go amnesiatic. Uh, let me find my cut list and then we'll go for Ah, never mind, I found it. This stuff writes itself, folks, trust me. Alright, so the next piece I'm going to do now, jeez, uh, I could pick something and just go from there, but I need box sides here. This will be the side of the bench where the seat kind of, it comes down here, so that when this opens up, I can't open it because this is on top, but when this seat opens, it's going to open into a storage area. So the box side, we're going to call it the box, the side is 7 inches by that 11 and 3 quarter. Okay, I found a small piece that uh, will end up working. Uh, it's a hideous piece. It's got, looks like it's got, I don't know, paint or some other crap on here along with the glues and stuff like that. Uh, when I measured this thing out, I only need, uh, you know, we're going 7 inches, 7 inches, so I need 14. And my mark is, if you can see it, let me zoom, cameraman, zoom it. It is a little bit over 17 and a quarter. Uh, so I've got more than enough space here to make two box sides out of this. All right, so once again, oh yeah, this is pretty hideous looking, I know. It looks ugly as sin now, but trust me, when I'm done with it, she'll be a thing of beauty. So that's one side. Here's the other side. It's like uh, all this glue got smushed in there, and it's just, it's pretty hideous. <laughs> ugly piece is now a really nice looking well it looks like a cutting board right now but anyways it is a nice piece of red oak ready to be cut into its into its size to make the two box sides so I'm gonna mark that up get that cut and then we'll have that taken care of so stick around all right so we've got our box sides taken care of so there they are so they're gonna sit like that off to the side the seats gonna sit on there so when it opens these will be the sides alright so we have our seat we have our backrest and we have our box sides so now we gotta decide what's our next piece that we're going to do and by the looks of it I've got a lot of options here but I'm thinking the next one is going to be the if I can see here back box face this one down here so this one is 35 and a half inches long by five and a half inches all right so here we are we are now going to make the back box face and what that is is the under seat storage uh, part of the box this is the back of the bench now uh, facing outwards uh, to the to the back Pretty self-explanatory. All right, so this piece needs to be around the 35 and a half inch uh, long mark, which is more than sufficient for this. We're going to take this, and once again, all these pieces of wood are all this glue and all this junk all over them. So we're going to run this through the planer uh, a few times. We're going to get it down to thickness, and then we're going to rip it to our width that we're going to need. And then with the rest of these pieces here, uh, we can use them either for legs or we can draw out the armrests if I have enough room for it or whatever, I don't know yet, I'll have to figure it out, uh, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. So I'm going to get my uh, dust collection fired up, get my uh, hearing protectors on, and we're going to start this, uh, well, start this machine and get this party started. So stick around, I'll be back in a moment. Ah! 
So 35 and a half there, so 35 and a half falls here, and I take my combination square, and if I want to make sure that this edge is fairly decent, since I know this edge is square, when I put this up against here, this is square as well. So that being good, we have a nice flat surface here, and then I find my lines, there they are, and then I take it from here. 35 and a half and now all we need to do mark our line so I'm gonna put some pressure here let's do a light line first so this way if the ruler moves it'll be easy to erase that line and do it again try not to move your ruler whatever you do all right so that's pretty much going to tell me right there, this is the line that we are going to cut. There it is. So I'm going to set up my uh, table saw. We're going to get this thing cut down to its proper width, and we'll carry on from there. All right, so I've got it uh, set on the table saw here. Uh, I've set my fence to where it needs to be to line up with that. Uh, that strip that I'm going to need. The reason why you're looking at this angle is just to show the table saw teeth, these teeth here, need to be raised up to a point where it clears the wood by a little more than half a tooth. Some people are, are a little bit picky. It's got to be a little bit of the tooth showing or just barely showing through or a whole tooth showing through. Some people just kind of jack it up like this and away they go. For me personally, I like to get pretty much most of the tooth, and the tooth I'm talking about is this carbide piece here. Alright, uh, I just thought of something before I made my cut, uh, or before I was going to start to do the cut. Uh, it's important to mention that you have the proper little supports in place. I've got a little outfeed table support roller here so that when the board comes through there'll be something supporting it, because I've got this death trap of a skill saw, table saw here, that, uh, you know, is not the greatest saw in the world. Uh, but anybody looking to donate a saw that they no longer want or need, a good table saw or cabinet saw, hey, I'm all game for taking it because anything, even a beaver, is an upgrade from this thing. So, uh, a little safety note here. Get your supports in place. And what's also a good idea, I, I tried doing a practice uh, do a practice run through to make sure that everything's going to be okay so there's no surprises. That's the last thing you want. A table saw spinning a blade at a couple, a few thousand revolutions per minute with these really sharp carbide teeth and something to go wrong because you didn't expect it. So do a couple of dry runs through. So here we go. That's been taken care of. Now I'm going to plug my saw back in, raise up my blade, and away we go. All right, hold on a second. Okay, so the next piece we're going to do now is our back box face. Uh, these measurements are not uh, exact. There's an actual change that's going to happen here. But we've planed the back box over here, the, the face for the back box, the back of the box. And there it is. Now, what we're going to do, if I had better battery power, I'd be able to take this off. But the measurement that we're going to wind up uh, doing for this is... Uh, I'm going to be 35 and a half inches and the depth is going to be the same as what we did for our box sides which is seven inches so at seven inch mark I measured seven inches made a line set my fence uh, to allow also for the width of the blade and the carbide teeth and did a couple dry runs just to make sure that this is going to line up and cut on the waist side of the line. Alright, so I've got everything set up. My outfeed rollers is all set up. My, my table saw of death here is uh, ready to pretty much kill me. So I am going to pretty much fire this thing up and we're going to make that cut at 7 inches. And we will continue from there and hopefully this bench goes together the way as it's planned.
Okay. Get my safety gear on. Make some sawdust. come to a stop. There we go. Take off all this stuff here so I can see and hear and breathe again. Alright, so here we have it. This is our piece that's going to go off to the side and be used somewhere else at some point. Keep that there. Now this is our piece that's going to make up our back face that we're going to put the box up against. Side rails have been cut. These, like I said earlier, go beside the seat that will open. So this is a miniature mock-up, but the, the bench seat's going to be here. There's going to be a back piece here. So this pretend, pretend this part here would be the back piece, and this part here would be the actual bench seat. So this is going to be what opens and this is going to be kind of like the frame that goes around the seat. But what we have to do is we have to cut these to their proper length. They're a little bit too long. 14 and 1 8 inches, not 18. So, get my pencil. And we mark. See which side is the better side, which side I like better. Alright, so this side looks like it might be the upside because we've got some irregularities here. So this will be the downside. So, once we've got that measurement marked out, I don't need a big square. I'll get away with this little 4-inch engineer square here. We'll line up our mark here. We'll get as close as we can to that line. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the same thing for this board here. Sometimes when you transfer a mark by sight, by lining up that way, something always goes wrong. There we go. All right, so we got those two marked. I'm going to cut those off now, and then I'm going to have to come back to my back frame part, and I'm going to have to trim it down because this is going to be too long now. This, I'll have to zoom out here so you can see. You sound like Vince Lombardi. What we're trying to do is to get a seal here, and a seal here, and a seal here and run the seat in the alley. So when I put this together just to show you what I'm talking about this is basically how it's going to look uh, with the side rails and the back rail uh, and stuff like that <clears throat> and then for the actual uh, seat itself it will look like this. So this will fit into there and then you'll have the piano hinge that will allow that to open and close. So now I'm going to mark the floor like I said. I just wanted to show you that because I had to put it together to see how it fits. So I figured, you know what, might as well just hit the button here, record a few seconds so you get the idea. So that's taking shape for the bench box. So uh, what I have to do now is i got to mark the 33 inches and then take my combination square here and mark a straight line and cut this on the table saw, the table saw of death and doom and then I will have my floor for the box. What I've done here is I've done the shape kind of like a almost like a shoe insert kind of a look to it really. Now what I did here in order to get this is I kind of made use of the French curve. Would use this to kind of smooth out 
what looks to be like you know the rougher areas so I can make it look a little a little bit better that way and then after I kinda would mark out my lines and then I would come by with the eraser and then clean things up and then get an idea of the shape and then tweak it the way I'd want to so for uh, if I wanted to kinda make this line flow a little bit better then what would I do? I would just kinda put this up. It's obviously too big, the pattern is too big for this French curve so you kinda kinda eyeball certain areas like you go from here and then you go to about here and then you kinda can follow like this you know what I mean and then you just do little bits at a time and then that's how you can utilize the curve a little bit better because um, my freehand one side would look one way and the other side would look pretty brutal or I'd be half this way and then the other half would be squirreling off a different way so French curves are actually a pretty handy tool. They're just going to take a little bit of getting used to sometimes. Okay, here we go. turned off so this is what we ended up with it's going to be this is a rough kind of an outline but I mean it's not too shabby of a cut with the bandsaw it's a 3 8 inch blade um, I don't know what else to tell you about it. how many teeth per inch I don't know I gotta look that up but try to stay close to the line without going in the line I tried to stay as much to the waist side uh, without going too much waste having to sand off uh, so this can be done on my belt sander when I uh, want to clean this up or file it down or sand it or whatever but I think I'll just hit it with the belt sander really quick alright just a quick little update <clears throat> before I uh, start the bandsaw I have switched over to my 5 8 uh, resaw blade because I really don't want any blade drift I started getting that a little bit with that, with that blade I had on there, that 3 8 you can see just at the tip she started to go on me so that's when I just stopped everything changed over to the thicker blade and now this should end up cutting uh, a straighter cut without so much drift and hopefully uh, the thicker blade will work out better one way of doing it. I kind of did it a, a bit of a wrong way, but uh, 
hindsight being 2020, when I make the next one, I'm going to have the blank with the pattern cut out uh, in, a, in a bit more of a rectangle, cut it in half, and then once it's cut in half, I'll have two square pieces or rectangular pieces like this. I'll then tape them together with double-sided tape and then cut my pattern out and then separate it. That's the proper way to really do it. I'm just going to sand down these inside parts here. Once we get it on the router, we're going to round these over. It'll be a nice, uh, and, you know, nice decorative effect. But, uh, yeah, not too shabby. If these wind up being a little bit too thin, then I'll just redo it with a bit thicker stock and do it over again. Alright, on to the next step. So I've got my resaw blade still on there. I've got my resaw push block, uh, guide block here. Uh, we're at 11 and 3 8 inches, and that's pretty much the capacity of my, uh, my resaw. So we're going to resaw this down to an inch and an eighth, and then we're going to go from there. I'll run it through the planer and clean it up, and then I'll rip it to the proper width, and we'll make our apron. So I have now resawn the, uh, well, the apron piece. So it's still standing up here. So I've taken this piece off here. All right. And as you can see, this side of the board, the reason why I took this side off is because there's a lot of some damage that's going on on this side. And I don't need the full board anyways. I'm only going to take the best side. So I cut off what looked the worst, and I kept what was the best. And then from there, I will turn around I'm going to make the pattern, I'll cut it out. I'm going to put it right now, as it is like this, I'm going to run it through my uh, planer. Because since it's, it's a big piece like this, even if I get a little bit of snipe here, it's not going to matter, because once I make my pattern and cut it out, I'm going to cut that snipe part out anyways. Okay, so we've got our apron piece here. What I'm going to end up doing now is I'm going to rip it to its width, and then we're going to cut to make its final length. So right now, this is the good side. Uh, I'm going to use this side because this side, there's way too many voids in this material to be used as a face. There's no way. So that's going to be the inside. This will be the show piece of the outside. Most likely this is going to be the good section up here. And we're going to end up cutting our pattern somewhere around here uh, in this area after I've ripped this off. I got my air filter going. I got my safety equipment on. I put the roller there for outfeed support for safety so the board doesn't just fall off on the end. Okay, now we're going to rip to our width of 33 inches. Alright, so we have our apron piece here, and uh, what I've done is I've marked off how I'm going to cut uh, this, this piece, like a template. I didn't have a template to work with, so I had to kind of MacGyver something together. How I ended up doing it is I found the center of the board and I made my line down the center. And then what I ended up doing is with my center finding ruler, I went three quarters of an inch off to each side and put a mark. After I made my mark of three quarters of an inch on each side, then I went to the ends and went in three quarters. And I went in three quarters to keep it kind of symmetrical. And then what I ended up using is an eight inch grindstone. Uh, this that I used earlier for the backrest is a bit too small. I wanted something a little bit bigger. I wanted a bigger arch. And, uh, and the only way I can get it symmetrical is to use something like this. So what I ended up doing is I marked my wheel with an unnumbered mark here to line up with the stock here. And then in order, once I found the diameter I was happy with, then I would go to another mark. This would be the number two in this case because it's a smaller arch. So I would end up turning this here so I can show you. So this mark here lines up with that. And then this mark here will end up lining up with the number two. And then all you end up doing is you mark your line right around. Okay. And then what I would end up doing is I would come over again the, the three quarters of an inch and I would do the same thing. I would line up my line here, the unmarked line, and when I was happy with the arch that I had here, it took a few tries, then I put a mark on the stone here, number one. 
and then I would trace my line. Then what I can do is I can take the pattern without having to, to worry about flex curves or anything like that because that thing is just a piece of junk and yeah I don't like it and what I would do is I would just transfer my mark the unnumbered mark goes up against the edge of the stock and I line it up with in this case for the smaller one the number two and I would make my line come over again three quarters from the end that's how, how I stayed symmetrical and this is the bigger arch so I went to the number one okay and then I lined up that number one with my unnumbered line and then what I would end up doing is making my arch there to the number one that's how I did it so I've got this lined up and this is how I did this part here so once this is in the center we just kinda take this and we just kinda blend these two together this is gonna be a bit of an eyeball shape we're gonna kinda you know fix this up a little bit by hand to make it flow a little bit smoother but then once we take away all these lines here you can see this part here is what's going to come out and then that's our template and that's how it's done that's how I transferred from one side to the other and that's pretty much the apron there so like I said once I get it band sawed out I'll show you the apron when it's done and then we'll continue with the next part which uh, should be the legs by then okay so we finished the uh, apron cutting it out on the band saw this is just a very rough uh, outline of it. I haven't done any sanding or anything. So what we've got here is that pattern that I've cut out. This is pretty much it. So this will be uh, the front of the bench, the decorative part. Okay, what we're going to do now is I'm going to rip my front legs down to width and then later on I will cut them at the height that I want them to be at. So I'm going to get this all measured out as far as what we want for our height and then I'm going to get my other back legs prepared now. Okay, so what I've done here for the leg now is I've measured out what I'm going to need. This is 37 and a half, uh, 37 and a quarter inches that I've got from the top to the bottom, uh, from top to bottom. And then what I've ended up doing is uh, I've made the leg a little bit wider at the bottom that's for strength and stability because we're bending the leg just a little bit away from the whole uh, bench unit so the total uh, width here of the actual leg at the bottom is two and a half inches but the actual leg itself is only two and an eight alright and then coming up here what I ended up doing is uh, after the bend I gave one inch of just leg exposure uh, from here to here is eight and a quarter inches. I'll zoom in here a little bit so you can see it. I don't think you're going to see these lines very well because they're kind of faded pencil lines. They're not very dark. But from, from this point to this point here, from here to here, this is where the box bench seating is going to be, where the, where the seat flips up. And this is eight and a quarter inches. And then from here to here is just an open space up here. Up here is just some open space for uh, the backrest before we get to the backrest and then from here this is going to be the bottom of the bench backrest here and then coming up the leg will be behind it and at some point I'm going to do a little bit of a profile somewhere up the backrest not all the way up and I'm cutting this up a little bit longer than I'd want just because it's a little bit better to cut long than to cut short and realize you know what this isn't long enough and I wish I cut it longer so I made it longer on purpose so I can bring the the overall height of the leg at the back behind the backrest down to where I want it without being too short so uh, the, the bend itself here it's not so much uh, how many degrees but what I did I ended up coming out about an inch so the distance between here and here is one inch and that's how I got this angle here and then I'll kind of round this over a little bit. I'll use maybe a little bit of a French curve to kind of just bring it a little bit more gracefully instead of such a chop-chop look to it. So we're going to end up cutting this off here at this dark line that you're seeing. This is, I, I used a Sharpie here. I'm going to cut this off. We're going we're to cut the same width overall off 
stack them, use double-sided tape, and then I'm going to cut the outline, and then I'll have two bench legs for one cut, and they'll both be identical. Alright, so here we have it on the bandsaw. I've cut it to the width. I have double-sided taped one end and put them together. And now we have it, so we're going to put it on the bandsaw and run it through. I'm using a half-inch blade, five teeth per inch, and uh, we're going to make this a bit of a finer cut because I don't want to do too much sanding with such a rough cut like a resaw blade. Half-inch will take care of this just fine. So we're going to run this through now and then carry on from there. So, stick around. All right, so here we have it. It was on the bandsaw. It's been cut. So when we take these pieces apart and get rid of the waste here, then we're left with our leg. You can see it's got the taper coming down, then it has its straight part here for the box, and then the leg that tapers out to a slightly wider bottom because there's going to be a lot of force coming down here. I didn't want to make this too thin. So now we're just going to pry this apart and we have two of our legs. So I'm going to scribe these out on some template material so I've got that done and then we're probably going to do a dry fit from there so I'm going to be busy for a while but you'll be back with me and well, click up a button. Okay all my pieces are cut out and I'm going to route the profile around the seat cover and this backrest and that's using a half inch round over bit and then we're going to be on to the pieces that will be routed with a one quarter inch round over bit which will be the armrests, the apron, the decorative part the back legs with the outside face and then we're going to go to the pieces that need to be routed with a 1 8 inch round over bit which will be the front legs, the outside faces of them, the inside apron part which you'll see later and the decorative backrest pieces if I decide to use them on this project. So stick around. Alright so we've routed the backrest part now it's going to be on to the front of the seat only and for the bottom of the backrest we do not round that over, that remains flat. I'm going to take a plane to this and straighten it out. And now with all of our pieces been routed, now it's on to the sanding. We're using 220 sandpaper because it come off the plane machine pretty good, so 220 should work just fine. Alright, so we've finished routing everything that we needed to route, and I finished sanding all the pieces. And then what I did is with these two, those two, and the apron at the back, uh, I wiped them down using mineral spirits, and a like a blue shop cloth there. Uh, we'll go through the steps and I'll show you how I did it in a second. This the leg here has not been wiped down at all so we're gonna go through this together. Alright so here we are um, got our gloves on, we've got our mineral spirits and we've got our shop cloth so what I'm gonna do what I usually do, I don't usually take the outside face, I usually go with the inside face because I know it's absolutely clean because this sits around in my shop too and it could have dust in there. A little ain't lying though, but whatever. So all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to wipe this off to see, to show you how much dust is on there. See, there's a fresh clean blue cloth and when you wipe the surface, that's one wipe. See what's on there? And we'll zoom in to show you what it's going to kind of look like here. And it'll give you also an idea when you put the oil on what it's kind of going to look like. It won't be an exact replica but it'll give you a bit of an idea. Alright so then you wipe it on All right, and that starts getting all the dust off. I turn it over. Big difference huh? Look at that. Now you can actually see. There's some, there's some reflex going on in here because this is quarter sawn wood. This has uh, been cut with the, with the growth rings going straight up and down, so this will give this reflex pattern. That's what you're looking at. So let me see if I can do here half with a finish and without a finish. It's not really a finish, but you get the idea. That's the difference.
Okay, we're at the uh, finishing stage now. So what I'm going to end up using is polymerized tongue oil on top of this. And uh, I got mine at Lee Valley. That's what it looks like. There it is right there. And uh, what I'm going to end up doing is I'm just going to put some in a cup here. And then after I get some in there, what I'll wind up doing is I'm going to flood the surface and then we leave it for around 30 minutes. Alright, I found a way uh, to put the tongue oil on, uh, even this uh, uh, polymerized tongue oil sealer is what I, was, what I was using, and I found this technique with that stuff to, to work better than brushing it on with, uh, with a brush and then wiping it off with a rag, because especially with the red oak, it kept coming out of the pores of the wood, you had to keep wiping and wiping and wiping, it was driving me nuts, I'm getting tennis elbow here. So what I ended up doing is I was done for the night and I was pouring all my, my stuff back into the can and there was just a little bit at the end uh, in there, just like a tiny, tiny puddle like from all the stuff that just eventually ran down to the bottom of the can, uh, to the bucket here. And there was a couple of spots on the wood, like, like seemed like, looked, looked like little dots, like brush flicks. So I just took my finger with some of that oil and just kind of rubbed it on and just wanted to rub it in before it ended up setting like that and being a bit more of a problem where I'd probably have to do a little bit of sanding and stuff. And then when I did that and glazed it over, it was kind of like a, a, a nice sheen and it stayed flat. It didn't kind of run into any grooves or anything like that. So I figured, okay, I took some more. I found a few more spots, so I took my finger and I kept rubbing and rubbing. And I started to realize this is actually kind of not a bad way of putting this on. It's, it's, it's more even than using a cloth. So I ended up taking what was left in there and dumping it on here and there and using my finger and wiping. And once I cleaned it all off, the result was actually pretty decent. The result I got, and uh, you, I did have to do a very minor amount of sanding, but I sanded it with 3,200 grit and then just wiped it off with a little bit of mineral spirits very very lightly on a cloth like, just to wipe off, wipe off the dust and this is the shine that I got just from the sealer alone and that's by using my hand in the oil with these blue gloves so I'll show you what I mean here because what I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe this piece down I ended up sanding down all my pieces to that 3200 grit and now I'm going to take the oil and just put it on my gloves and just wipe it and I'll show you kind of what the difference is here. So I'll just do, let's do from half from here and then down this way. Okay. Just kind of spread it out so it's not too heavy. Okay. Right. Actually, to show you, you might get a better idea if I do this. So, I use my, my glove as the applicator. And it leaves a better finish to dry than if I was to use a cloth. It comes out... Looking like that. Let's see if I can get it closer for you. All right, so I've got my first coat on, and uh, that technique that I used using the uh, the glove uh, actually was much better as an end result than using rags and I used a lot less, a lot less waste and I didn't have to go through all this. So after I've wiped on that uh, tongue oil sealer, which is uh, this can again here, and you leave it like a bit of a thin coat, not a thick gloopy coat or whatever, and then I had to sand this down because you still get like those little fuzzy feelings here and there, some dust settles on it, uh, some little air bubbles uh, might have. Uh, come up to the surface through the pores and stuff like that. So I ended up sanding it with two different grits. I sanded it with 6,000 grit by hand, not by machine, don't use a machine, and 8,000 grit. All the pieces are now 
uh, done with their first coat. But now what we're going to do is we're going to put another coat on. That was the sealer coat. Now we're going to put a blend. I'm going to blend some of the sealer with actual tongue oil. This is what I got left of the original mix, which was probably a 60-40 mix. Uh, 60 tongue oil, 40 tongue oil sealer. And uh, then we're going to rub it on again using gloves. Okay, so I've prepared all my surfaces. Everything's been wiped down. I've run a slightly damp cloth with some mineral spirits over all of the surfaces just to get any residual of the dust fibers from that high grit sanding that we did just to clean everything out. So again all I'm gonna do is with my fingers no brush, no nothing, nothing fancy, it's all low tech from here I just take my hand and just kinda dip it in there and just kinda Wipe it on. That's it. You know, you stir it around a little bit, no big deal. So I guess we can call this a hand rubbed finish. A truly hand rubbed finish. <laughs> Cheap pun, I had to do it. Alright, so I'm going to do this to all the pieces. I'm also going to make sure my sleeve is up so I don't get my sleeve in the oil. I'm going to do this to all the pieces again. And then we're going to let it sit. And the best thing to do, if it's coated properly, you know, check on it when you're done. Make sure everything looks uniform and everything looks nice and smooth and stuff. And then I usually want to leave it for, yeah, maybe 30 minutes. I'll come back and check on it just to make sure nothing funky is going on. If I have excess, a good thing to do with the excess, instead of just wiping it off, grab a smaller piece that you know what you got to do anyway, like, uh, let's say this arm, and just with the excess it's good enough to do this because that's kinda what you want you want that thin coat because eventually that's what you're gonna get down to here right now this looks really wet and sloppy and stuff and I get that I'm just gonna coat these pieces just get them wet right just with your excess just rub it on that's it got some excess wipe it off Merry Christmas there you go see get your end grain in there too All right. got another small piece Grab another small piece. This one is done. So I've already finished this piece. This piece is done. Off to the side you go. Next piece. Yeah, might as well grab the second arm. So as we're wiping this in, making this all nice and level and even, getting into whatever pores and little knots and whatever else here, smoothing out that surface instead of wasting it, coat other pieces with it. I'm going to end up probably putting more on these armrests anyways. And the reason why I want more on the armrests eventually is because people's hands and arms are going to be on here. They're always going to have their hand here as they're sitting down. So this whole area here, I want to make sure I get a lot of oil on there. You've got to think, this piece, people are going to be using it. They're going to be sitting on it. They're going to have their hands on it. So you want to have the protection highest in the higher wearing areas, like the hands going on the hand rest, the seat, because people are going to be sitting on it and using the front of the lid and always lifting up on it. There's always going to be somebody grabbing it up here, so I really want to make sure that the areas that are going to end up being used the most have the most protection. Wipe that down. Another piece is done. That's it. That's all you got to do. Hand rub it on. So with this excess again, I'm just going to grab me a small piece. This is one of the, the side rails. See, I got another piece done. There you go. Check for any bubbling, any rough patches, any dry patches. After I rub this on, what I'm going to look for, I'm going to look down the, the rows here, I'm going to look down in the shine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, because I have a window over there, and if there's any dry spots, I'll see it in that shine. And if there is, I just take a little bit of oil, a couple drops, rub it on. Another thing you can do <clears throat> with the bottom of the bench legs in order to get some of that end grain, I just take it and I'll just dip it right in. The end grain will soak that up a little bit and I'll just wipe off what's left. Ooh, and we've got to get the edges here.
and going by a photograph, this isn't turning out so bad. Alright, so I've come back to this piece that we've started with, and already I can see it's got a nice shine to it, a nice coat. See if I can kind of do something to show that to you. Uh, you can kind of see it like that. You can see the reflection. So we're not doing too shabby here. We're actually doing pretty good. It's also a good time to take a moment and look around your edges to look to see if there's any pooling or any kind of issues where you've got that extra little bit on the edges that if you leave it not only are you going to notice it but you're going to have to sand it. So it's a good idea to take care of those things now so you don't have to worry about it or deal with it later. Finishing is actually an art all onto itself. And when you decide on a finish there's a lot of things to consider. Will this be an outdoor project or an indoor project? Is this going to be something that people are going to handle frequently? Is there going to be food coming into contact with this? So it's... If you get into woodworking, you're kind of having to learn two major subjects as opposed to just the one. Because finishing makes everything that you just spent all your time on come together. It gives it life. It turns it from a dull piece of looking material that you've been working on and then all of a sudden you put some oil on it or a shellac or whatever and all of a sudden you see the true colors of a wood coming out. You see some life all of a sudden. <laughs> you know what it's like when you put the finish on a piece of wood? Really? It's pornography for woodworkers. That's exactly what it is. Because every woodworker when they put that finish on the wood, or that stain, or whatever it is, and it brings out that color, and it brings out the texture, or it brings out the grain, or if you put an oil on a, on a figured maple and you, and you see the grain pop, like those tiger stripes just pop out at you, that's what everybody loves to see. It's like pornography for woodworkers. That's all it is. Oh my god. You gotta be kidding. Am I done? All right, let's go for a ride. All right, so here we are. This is what we're looking at. You know, the finish, yeah, like I was complaining. Aha, uh -huh, see? You got to come back and check that. You see, that's what I was talking about right there. Yeah, I'll use my finger. Move my finger off here. I need a little bit of traction here for this. It's going to be a little wet looking for a while. All right. So there, there's the, that's the inside of the lid. I put this as the inside because there's a defect here, there's a knot. And there's the apron. I'm looking for any dry spots, I'm going to use that light. And there's no dry spots, everything is uniform. Everything looks good. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm looking for dry spots using the reflection that I'm getting in the camera. So you can also see the glare and what it should pretty much look like. Okay, so it's another day and today what we're going to do is put our box portion of the bench together. So the finish, as you can see, is, is now finally finished. It actually turned out very nice, um, especially using that glove technique for applying it uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, this turned out really, really well. I am more than happy with the, the tongue oil, um, the finish and the, and the quality of it. Uh, Alright, so what we're going to do is uh, we've got the box floor, the box sides, and the box back uh, all set up here, kind of like a bit of a dry fit. And uh, in order to put it together, we're going to put it together with uh, some screws. We're going to countersink them, and then we're going to put some plugs in there to cover them up so you don't see them. So what we've got is we've got two here to support the seat on, on this end here, 
and two smaller screws here that will support the apron. Uh, these screws, these small screws that will be for the apron are number 10s and they are 2 inches long. The screws that are going in to support the floor of the uh, bench box uh, and, and secure these box sides to it, these are number 12s by 2 and a half inches. All right, so, and basically I've done a basic layout of how I'm going to have the screws uh, drilled in. Okay, so when I have the area of the screw where it's going to go in, I just take a pencil line and very lightly just scribe a line in that area. And I'll see it, when I'll be able to see it, it's not going to be very dark, and then you can just be able to either erase it with a with a good eraser or just a little bit of uh, mineral spirits will wipe that off as well. So just a matter of using a simple tool to help you with a difficult task. All right, just to show you how I figured out the spacing of my screws evenly, what I did is I laid a ruler down and uh, what I did is I offset by the half inch ruler because remember this being the half the width of this ruler when I put my screws in I'm going to have a set of screws already here so I'm offsetting by that point on each end because it's going to be on both sides the same thing the way I'm going to mark it for that so I ended up with a total uh, measurement of 34 and a quarter so I divided that up uh, half of that is 17 and an eighth and half of that is 8 and uh, nine sixteenths or just you know eight and a half inches uh, we're not going to go splitting hairs at that point uh, and then on the other side it's going to be 25 and nine sixteenths or just 25 and a half so I've got my screws laid out there I'm going to use this as my guide to just put down and and put my mark my pencil mark lightly on there and then uh, afterwards we can easily wipe that pencil mark off just don't dig your pencil in sometimes you run into the problem that even when you mark the area where you're going to have your screw in, you have grain that's already dark like that, so you're not even going to see your pencil line. So the way that I can work around that is I hold this in place and then I just use a utility knife and just gently, gently, gently score the area and I'll feel that scratch. I'm going to feel that scratch so I'll know that's the area I want my screw to be in and it doesn't show, it doesn't mark, and it doesn't really do any damage whatsoever. Okay, so I've got uh, the box sides screwed in and I've set up the camera now to show uh, how I do this. I've made my marks, this is one of them here, and uh, I've got them evenly spaced out. I figured uh, the, the length and then I divided it by how many screws I wanted to, so I've got a mark here at this edge here, a uh, half inch, and then I've got one at eight and a half, seventeen and an eighth, uh, twenty-five and a half, and then the one half inch from the other side. And then going upwards, I've got another two. Uh, there's going to be one up here and one uh, near the top there for added stability for the box sides. So what I end up doing, let's get this project going here instead of me yakking away. I'm going to take my scratch all or my all or whatever you want to call it and then I'm going to put it on the center point here and then I'm just going to punch a little hole in that's my starter hole so once I've got that and then I'm going to take my drill it's got a 3 16 bit on there I center it up in the hole and then I'll put this on a low speed and then I'll drill my hole and then I'm going to switch it to a faster speed and then I, I raise the drill bit ever so slightly just to clear out the wood chips but not high enough that the drill bit's going to pop out of there and I just periodically check make sure I'm still level so my hole isn't all cockeyed I'm going to continue drilling the rest of the holes where they need to be. We'll flip it over and then I'll start the camera up again. And then we're going to take our countersink bit, which is this thing here, and we're going to bury it right up to there, right, pretty much right full depth, so that this way when I put the plug in, the plugs can be uniform in thickness, and then I can just wipe some oil on them. 
All right, so I've drilled most of the way through until I can feel the tip of the drill bit coming through the other side. And just so I don't cause any problems or blowout or whatever, what you can do is you can just take your little scratch all and just kind of poke through so you can find your hole a little bit easier. It'll only take a gentle tap at this point because you pretty well drilled most of the way through. You can kind of see here a little protrusion and then we can take our drill and then just clean up that hole. Just like that. Alright, so I've got all my holes drilled, all of everything's pre-drilled. Now what I'm doing is I'm pretty much kind of tacking the bottom and then the, the top, but I put one in the middle here just to stabilize. Now I can put the rest in. And when I put them in, I don't just you know, go fast speed and, and pull the trigger all the way and put it all the way in. I go in gently because I don't want this to skip and jump and then mark the wood with a dent or a scratch or something like that. But I still have to push inward so that the Robertson bit doesn't jump out because it will. Even though that I've drilled these, pre-drilled these slightly oversized to the uh, recommendation, these screws still go in fairly tight. Even with the wax, some of them are pretty tight. As far as these screws, again, they're number 12s, two and a half inch what I'm using. And I'm just using that, you know, that antique wax that you get from, I think I got this from Home Depot or something. Just get a little bit of wax on your screw. And then I just, with my fingers, kind of just twist it on there. And if I still got some on there, I'll just rub it on. And then with my nails, just gently get all the threads kind of covered somewhat. All right, so now I'm in the other part of the wood, the, the bench box floor, and this is the part where I go in gently, because this will pop out, because there is tension here. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to put on the frame back and sides, and what I've done is I've lined up my piece that comes to the edge here and lines up with the back and the side, on both ends. And then what I did, instead of like a pencil or anything, I used my scratch all because it gives me a much finer marking. And I scratched the top here to indicate the end of each side of the box, uh, the seat frame, basically. So now when I need to do my marking, I can see there's my line. That's where I'm going to go to. So in order to mark this, because the thickness of the wood is the same as when I marked for the back to do the screws here, I'm going to use my 6 inch ruler and I'm going to basically lie it on the back here and after I mark, uh, after I measure this total length here and then I'm going to divide by three screws. I'm going to have one on the end, one in the middle, one on the other end. That'll be more than enough to hold this in place. More than enough. So what I'm going to end up doing is after I figure out where it's going to go, then I will with a, I could with a scratch all, just kind of take the tip and just kind of poke where I want my screw hole to go. And then it'll be the same procedure as I did for the back. I'm going to drill my holes, pre-drill the holes. Pre-drilling is very important. I cannot stress that enough. You need to pre-drill. It'll make life so much simpler. It won't split out. You won't have any problems. Yeah, it takes more time. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. But yeah, you got to do it. So uh, I'm going to do it the same way that I did back here with these. Let me move the camera out of the way. I need a cameraman. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to drill the hole. I'm going to countersink the hole and I'm going to make room for a plug that will be the same size as all of these. This way it makes life easy as far as cutting plugs. Okay, so the apron is now screwed on, so we're just going to bring this back down. Alright, on to the next phase. Alright, so we're at the point now where I'm going to add the piano hinge uh, to the back box frame and attach it to the actual seat itself. So what I've done is I've cut it down, I've used a Dremel tool with a cutter on it, and I've cut it to 24 inches, which leaves 3 inches here, 3 inches here. 
as far as a space. I put this ruler down as a spacer just to keep those uh, well the joints themselves from rubbing against that wood or whatever just for a little bit of a smoother glide as well and I've made my mark here as you can see three inches on this side line it up and since it's cut to 24 inches there it is there's the other mark right here you can barely see it but it's there and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my uh, you can use a gimlet or whatever but I'm just gonna use a scratch all I'm just gonna tap each one of these holes so that I can get started with drilling, pre-drilling, and then we're going to put the screws in for it. And then what we're going to end up doing here is I've also marked three inches in from each side, and then when we put it together, then I can put my screws in from there, and then the seat will be back together, and then we'll put it back together on the frame. All right, so now I've attached one side of the piano hinge, and now I'm going to mark the seat portion so what I did is I lined up my piano hinge to the lines where I needed to put to put it and then I have to allow a space for this joint here this piano hinge joint because this has to end up getting space to push through here so I got these spacers that I have here and it was actually just a wooden bookmark I cut it in half and it's even on both ends so I just put it on the ends like that and then what I do is I make sure I've got enough space to cover for the joint and then with my pencil and I just kinda mark my circles and then I'll take my awl and then or my center punch and I will punch a little hole or a little dot in the center of these holes that I'm marking now and what that'll do is it'll give me my starting point for my drill bit my drill bit will be able to sit in that point and then I can drill straight down. Just clamping my fingers on it lightly and just twisting just to kind of coat and it gets inside the tip there and then that'll start spreading and squeezing out and then whatever's left on my fingers I just wipe off that on the top there okay so now that I've got everything lined up and I've got my spacers in I just with my screws I just do a little bit of a hand tightening just to hold it in place there so the screw will stay there waiting for me when I come with the drill one and we'll get the other side in place and now remove my spacers now I won't need them anymore there so if you can see that you see that all this little stuff around the corners here that is your squeeze out of the paste wax so that's why you don't use too much paste wax but just enough to give a little lubrication to make those screws go in a little easier. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of look down the piano hinge this way to see if I have any areas that I've over tightened and you'll or, or not tightened enough and you'll see by how the piano hinge if it if it's really wavy like you've really over tightened those screws or if everything is pretty pretty even and level I expect very little you know a little bit of up and down that's normal but nothing extreme and at the ends I don't want to see the ends curling up which would indicate that these last screws here at the end, these last two screws here would be too tight if this end is kind of lifted up just a little bit. Then I have to reduce the tension. Alright, so when we open this thing up, this is how it's going to sit. Right like that. Now that, I like that look. Alright, 
The good thing is the piano hinge is going to hold everything up for me, so I won't have to fight with two pieces. I only have to really fight with one. Good. Alright, so we're at the stage now. I've just added this foam weather stripping tape here, and it's pretty easy. You just kind of peel off the tape and put it on. So that'll prevent the lid from doing a hard slam and it'll give it that little bit of a protection when it closes. That's pretty much it for the box with the exception of having to fill these holes in and then we can get on to the legs. And now, before any shifting goes on, the best thing to do is to get that screw in now. Makes for a couple extra steps, I know, but it's better than having this thing shift on you later. Don't forget the wax on your screw. Okay, and then we just double check. If we need to make any micro adjustments, this will be the time to do it. So we've got two front legs now. There we go. So I offset the leg a little bit here and I can see where my holes are. So I'm going to have a screw that's going to support the bottom here so that it'll prevent racking when this is getting moved back and forth or side to side being put into position. And I've got a screw at the highest point that I can get it, which would be here, which would be in the middle where it'll get the most strength and support. And that'll be for the top to prevent any racking from the backrest. Okay. That's one hole done. Let's get the second one. Alright, so that's taken care of. We're going to get a little bit of sandpaper, flatten this out a little bit. Or I could even use a hand plane if I wanted to, but a little bit of sandpaper would be good enough. A little 220. Take that little fuzzy edge off right there. This is going to be up against the box bench anyways. Alright, so I've switched over to my countersink bit. Uh, if you don't have these countersink bits, this is what it looks like. I highly suggest that you get them. They are really handy. Uh, sometimes you can get drill bits that have a countersink on them already. Uh, but since I already have these, this is what I go with. And yeah, they're extremely handy, guys. If you, if you get the chance to pick up a set, I really recommend it. They're not that expensive. They really aren't. Okay. Keep blowing out your uh, your waste. It'll make your cut that much easier. Because if the cutter is clogged up, it's not going to cut. You're just going to spin and burn the wood at that point. See? Look. If my cutter head is clogged up like that, how is it going to cut? That's why you got to keep bringing it out, keep clearing it out, so that it's empty and chip free. And that's how it's going to continue to cut nice and clean and sharp for you. Okay, I got one tacked in place. Let's get the other one started. All right, so this is how it is sitting so far. We've got our legs, we've got our box, now all we really need to get done is the armrests, which are hiding back here. And of course I grab, oh no, this is a good one. So we're going to end up screwing this down into here. We're going to throw two small screws in down in here to hold this. Alright, and now we're just screwing in the second armrest. Now we just got to do the back portion here. Okay, so right now before I get the backrest on, I sanded the top down just to smooth it out a little bit. And then I'm just taking a uh, little bit of a rounding, corner rounding tool here. And I'm just going around the edges just to give them a chamfer. And watch for the tear out.
All right, so I used my 3 16 inch chamfering tool to bevel the edges, and now all I'm going to do is, I, I've already used some mineral spirits just to kind of clean up the dust a little bit and kind of keep this a little bit uh, on the cleaner side so I can see now. And now all I'm going to do with the file is on an upstroke in this case, I don't want to go down, I don't want to split the fibers out. You know, what I want to do is I just want to round the edge, I don't want to cause damage. So I'm going to come from here and I'm going to make sure that the entire surface of the file is against the flat part here. And then I'm just going to a couple pull strokes. And then around here I'm going to just round the edge. And then again, a couple pull strokes. Try to keep the file at the same angle at all times. Now here I'm going to come on the upstroke. And then again here. Now around the corners, you just kind of make sure that as you're pulling up, you're going around the, the edge. And then again, keep the same angle. All right, so I'm going to do that to the other side, and then we're going to clean that up a little bit. I'm going to throw some oil on that, let it soak in good and deep. And now we're going to get this backrest on. All right, so we're at the stage now where we need to put the backrest onto the bench. And what I'm going to use for that is uh, some number 12, two and a half inch screws. So what I've got here, what you can see, <clears throat> is I've got this down here because I want to rest it on here for some support. Okay, that's one. Now, I'm not too worried about the breakthrough on this side here, on, on the side that faces where the backrest is going to be, because it's going to be covered up. Okay, so I've countersunk these in a little bit and I just want to share a little tip with you. Before I put a screw in there and just start putting it in, what ends up happening when we run our countersinking bit is this hole that I drilled with the drill bit gets plugged up. So in order to take care of that, I want to clean it out before I put a screw in because the hole is already going to be pretty tight for those screws. So I want to get rid of the debris in there. So I'm just going to take this little gimlet because it's really thin and it's long enough where I can poke it through and we can get that debris out of there. All right, so we clear out that hole. All right, and now, and when you get close and blow in there, close your eyes because you don't want this stuff getting in your eyes, that's for sure. So now we have the hole cleaned out for this so that the actual screw can go through now without taking in a bunch of waste. Alright, so let's get that backrest on. Take a little bit of tension off so it's not over tight. Okay, so we've got it. Now our bench backrest is on. So let's zoom out here. Let's pull the bench out and have a look at it. All right, there we have it. Now, the next major thing that needs to be done is we've got to fill up these holes. As you can see, the bench is done, looking pretty good. After I get the dowel holes covered up, we have our storage area here. This opens up. So, as you can see, the bench has... Uh... Yeah, here we go, moment of truth. There we go. <laughs> look at that, you still don't even see me. I feel like Wilson, the guy behind the fence, home improvement. You never see my face. All right, so we put the plug in, and what I want to do is I want to make sure I try to line up the grain direction as best as possible. Now, this isn't the exact same grain as what is here, but we get it as close as we can so that we follow the grain so it doesn't look so awkward. So then we get that into pretty much into place there. It's not going to go in perfectly, 
It's going to be a little bit of a tight fit, and that's kind of what I want. I don't want it to be flopping around loose in there because I'm not putting glue because it's that tight. So what I do is I get it in there pretty good, line up my grain. Sometimes when you pound on this, it wants to all of a sudden move. Try to get that just flush with that. And we got a little piece that we're going to have to work with here as far as a fix. So sometimes crap happens. That's the thing about woodworking the professionals hide their mistakes better. So I got to get this little sliver work down. We're going to fill up that little bit of a hole and uh, be back in a moment. There we go. So I've sanded the edges down just a little bit, made it a little bit flatter on the flat side that broke, put it in there, pounded it down, and there you go. And then we're going to get some oil on these little dots here so that they match a little bit better. And then this bench is done. We've got a nice black piano hinge, we've got open storage here to put your whatever you want in here. We've got a nice little weather stripping strip down here just to soften the blow, and that's it. Well. There it is. Hard to believe we've got to this point from this. Yeah, we've come a long way. This, believe it or not, is the first bench that I have ever made. It is the first one I have ever attempted to make. And I made it from a picture that I got. It was an auction sale item and I took a few pictures of it and the pictures I had to work with looked like this see I had to get all my details from these pictures so in order to figure out how, how, how wide a piece was I estimated the width by using the cement, uh, using the tiles on the floor. Each tile was, I think, 12 inches. So I had to approximate how much this all was, and then count how many strips of wood to make the width. And then that's how I had to piece this whole thing together. And then the height, just standard bench heights, and then go from there. As far as the armrest height and stuff like that, the armrest height I went a little bit higher than a standard 8 inches because it just felt a little more comfortable. And so these are the pictures. This picture did I mean, absolutely no good. It's all just blurry. So these are the pictures that I had to go by. Every single piece that I had to figure out uh, from the laminated strips, how many, and then the approximate distances and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess you can call it investigative woodworking. <laughs> so all in all, I am quite happy with the project. Um, it turned out great, especially the finish on it, that uh, tongue oil that we used and the way that we put it on with that, that glove technique, that was, that was, that was the game changer. Um, the one thing that I didn't show uh, when, I, when I was scalloping in here, uh, how I planed this down because I had a hand plane and I couldn't get into this section here, I used one of these, a little spoke shave. Um, got into it it was easy to get into where I needed to and then smooth out the area that way using it like a plane like a hand plane and then sandpapered it down and it, it turned out really well uh, the total amount of board feet for this project that I've calculated is around 21.6 uh, basically if it comes out to six dollars and ten cents a board foot for the thickness you're going to need, because you're going to need to get inch and a half uh, stock, and uh, that works out to if the price is six ten a board foot. This is at uh, A and M Woods in Cambridge. Uh, it comes out to about 132 bucks. So after your taxes and stuff, you're probably looking 145 or something like that. I don't know. I'm not a wizard calculator here. Uh, so that's what your wood will end up costing, and then you've got whatever materials you want to put into it. Uh, your hinge, your screws, your dowels, you know, uh, all that's going to add up. So my next project, uh, when I know, I'm going to let you know. If you've subscribed, I thank you. And uh, I guess you'll be the first to know. And we'll go from there. So, yeah. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for watching. And, uh, yeah. Go make something. Take care.